Since the reign of Peter the Great, the Russian Empire had been attempting to expand southward at the Ottomans' expense. His successor, Catherine the Great, had captured control of the north shore of the Black Sea by 1783. By 1815, Russia had pried the Georgian region of the Caucasus away from the Ottomans, and the threat of Russian intervention had prevented the Ottomans from crushing Serbian independence. When Muhammad Ali's Egyptian army invaded Syria in 1833, Russia signed a treaty in support of the Ottomans. In return, the Sultan recognized Russia's claim to being the protector of all of the empire's orthodox subjects. This set the stage for an obscure dispute that resulted in a war. Bowing to French and British pressure, in 1852, the Ottoman Sultan named France the protector of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. Russia protested, but the Sultan held firm. So Russia invaded Ottoman territories in today's Romania. In November 1853, the Russian fleet spotted a Turkish fleet sheltering from a storm, and the Russians attacked them without warning. In fact, the Russians didn't stop until there was just one ship left. The British and French couldn't ignore what was happening. These powers were facing what was called the Eastern Question. Britain, France, and Russia all knew the Ottomans were in decline. If the Ottoman Empire collapsed, who would get their lands? This raised a lot of debate about the balance of power in Europe. Britain and France reasoned that if they helped the Ottomans defeat the Russians, they could put themselves in line for control of the Ottoman lands. So that meant that Britain and France, sworn enemies since basically forever, joined forces with the Ottoman Sultan against Russia in the Crimean War. The Crimean War only lasted three years, but this was the first war that built from the technology of the Industrial Revolution. Russian muskets were far overpowered by the rifled weapons of Britain and France, and it was the first war to involve a railroad, photography, and the telegraph. Photographers showed up to take the first battlefield photographs. The telegraph allowed war correspondents in Britain and France to transmit uncensored stories about battlefield devastation. One incident that made no strategic sense was the British charge of the Light Brigade, which saw 630 cavalrymen charge straight into Russian cannons. Over half the horses and 110 men died, another 200 were wounded, and almost 60 men were captured as prisoners of war. Aside from battlefield deaths, cholera killed many hundreds. Lieutenant Henry Clifford recalled that he had seen men arrive to the front on a Tuesday, take ill and die on Wednesday morning, and be buried Wednesday night. Cholera, dysentery, freezing temperatures, a lack of supplies, and poor decision-making nearly doomed the British. But the French troops kept them going. The Crimean War also created new opportunities for women in war zones. Florence Nightingale, a 34-year-old hospital manager in London, organized a team of 38 nurses to go to the main British war hospital, where she found horrible conditions. Rats, dirt, filth, men weren't being taken care of. One nurse found that one soldier's shoulder wound had not been dressed in five weeks, and I hope you're not eating. She proceeded to scoop a quart of maggots out of his shoulder. Those are her words, not mine. Just reading it kind of makes me sick. Nightingale's skills were less in the nursing profession than in the organization and administration side. She cleaned up the hospitals and kept the spread of disease much lower. Another woman of distinction had a completely different set of challenges, and that's Mary C. Cole. An elderly mixed-race woman from Jamaica traveled to London to join up with Nightingale's nursing team. Except they didn't give her so much the courtesy of an interview because of her race. Not to be turned away, she paid for her own way to the front and set up a business keeping soldiers in supply of food and homemade remedies. Unlike Nightingale, who was at the hospital far from the fighting, Seacole basically set up shop right on the front lines. She offered the men something they weren't going to get elsewhere, comfort, the taste of something they considered civilized. During battles, she would even go out under fire and offer wine, bandages, and food to the injured men. One soldier recalled, quote, a more tender hand could not be found, end quote, than Mary Seacole's. The war had several major battles, but none was more strategically important than the Siege of Sevastopol. 
Over the course of 11 months, from October 1854 to September 1855, British and French troops went back and forth with the Russians over the strategic port in Crimea. The Russians had a steady supply line and occupied the high ground, so it wasn't until the French and British were able to cut off the supply line that they could deliver the final blows. During that time, Tsar Nicholas I died, and his successor, Tsar Alexander II, came to power. So basically, six months into Tsar Alexander's reign, the Russians suffered a devastating defeat. Alexander II is going to sue for peace, and the Treaty of Paris 1856, because of course it has to be called the Treaty of Paris, recognized the supremacy of British, French, and Ottoman forces. In terms of the Ottomans, the Crimean War increased the Ottoman involvement with European commerce. The Ottomans established a bank and pegged the value of their gold coins to the British pound. The creation of banks, insurance companies, and bustling trade expanded cities like Istanbul, Damascus, Alexandria, and Cairo. But from the conclusion of the Crimean War onward, the Ottoman government became heavily dependent on foreign loans. The Ottomans lowered tariffs on European imports and let in European banks. Europeans who lived in Istanbul and other commercial centers enjoyed extraterritoriality, the right to be subject to their own laws and exempt from Ottoman jurisdiction. Kind of like diplomatic immunity in a sense. The decline of Ottoman power and prosperity had a strong impact on a group of well-educated young urban men who aspired to wealth and influence. They doubted that the empire's rulers and Tanzimat officials who worked for them would ever stand up to European domination. Though lacking a sophisticated organization, the Young Turks promoted a mixture of liberal ideas derived from Europe, national pride in Ottoman independence, and modernist views of Islam. Prominent Young Turks drafted a constitution in 1876, but their success was short-lived. Alexander II took the Russian throne in 1855 and learned a lot from the Crimean War. For one, the Crimean War taught him that Russia couldn't just throw bodies into a war effort. The Russians lost about half a million men. If they were going to survive any other military conflicts, they needed desperate reforms. The first and probably most important thing Alexander II took on was the emancipation of the serfs in 1861. Now, this isn't to say that all of Russia's problems ended once the serfs got their freedom. In fact, the way that emancipation came about and worked out laid a foundation for what would become the 1917 revolution. However, this was a starting point. This got the serfs the protections from their master's beatings, and the serfs had limited freedoms. They still couldn't really leave their jobs because of taxation issues, and they didn't get to own land, but it was still a step. Other reforms followed. In 1864, Alexander set about reforming the legal system, including the establishment of independent courts and the right to a trial by jury. In 1874, Alexander implemented some important military reforms. The old ways of press gangs, corporal punishment, and iron discipline were out. In was the new style of army. Train a reserve force that would cost less and could be called up whenever. Universal conscription meant anyone, noble or peasant, could be pressed into service, not just peasants. Alexander II also implemented military education of his officers and banned corporal punishment and branding as disciplinary measures. Economically, Alexander II authorized new joint stock companies, projected a railroad network to tie his country together, and supported scholarly work and the arts. Alexander II's reign saw Russia become a dynastic center of intellectual, artistic, and political life. This was the time of great composers like Peter Tchaikovsky, who composed The Nutcracker, Swan Lake, and the 1812 Overture celebrating Napoleon's defeat in Russia. Great writers like Fyodor Dostoevsky, who wrote Crime and Punishment, and Leo Tolstoy, who had served in the Crimean War and later wrote War and Peace and Anna Karenina. An emerging school of Russian artists called The Wanderers depicted modern scenes of peasant life and landscapes as opposed to traditional historical paintings. It's interesting to compare and contrast the Russian trajectory with the Ottoman one. Rulers in both empires instituted reforms, overcame opposition, and increased the power of their governments. These activities stimulated intellectual and political trends that would ultimately work against the absolute rule of the Tsar and the Sultan, 
Yet Russia would eventually develop much closer relations with Western Europe and become an arena for every sort of European intellectual, artistic, and political tendency, while the Ottoman Empire would ultimately succumb to European imperialism.